everybody. Thank you, Professor Lu, for inviting me. This is my first visit to Jindal's. I've heard so much about the university and I've heard so much about Mr. Jindal who got us the freedom to use the flag everywhere. I'm really thankful to you for giving that beautiful pen, which I think at EGRU will try to replicate with the Indian flag on it now. That's so beautiful and so thought of, so thoughtful of Mr. Jindal to have come out with that. Well, um, one of the reasons that I readily accepted the invite by Professor Alok was the chance to come and celebrate with you the thoughtfulness of the Indian policymaker and the stupidity of the Western policymakers. So today, I'm going to start with one illustration. And you will see that this issue of monetary tightening and what happens to the rest of the world will be visible to all of us. As Professor was mentioning, we all have heard, we all have read about Milton Friedman and his hypothesis, inflation anywhere and everywhere is a monetary phenomenon. We have also read, and I'm sure you in your classes are now reading, the quantity equation of money, which is the Cambridge equation of money, which has been more than 100 years old. That Cambridge equation of money is a very simple model, which says MV is equal to PY, M is money, V is velocity, P is prices, Y is real income. Now, at, a con at any given point of time, your velocity is constant. And of course, you can't change production overnight, so your real output is constant. That implies you increase the money supply, you increase inflation. And I always tell in my class, to understand this very basic thing, you need common sense and not a PhD from Columbia. You need a PhD from Columbia and Yale to look into the details and disaggregation of these things. I don't deny that. But this is re really a model which an Indian truck driver knows it. You press the accelerator, the speed will increase. You want to slow the truck, leave your feet from the accelerator. It's as simple as that. These Western policymakers are so complacent and I'll show you that they forgot this basic concept which an Indian truck driver knows. And let's take a plunge into it now. So here we are. I'm going to talk a little bit about the growth story of the world. I'll speak about inflation because that's what the key thing is. I'll talk about monetary tightening and its impact on India after that. And then I'll come and talk about a little bit about the way ahead. I intend to finish my talk in about 25 odd minutes. Here are the growth estimates, projections, as well as the ones which we have completed. And you can see India will continue to be the fastest growing economy of the world. We are growing at a pace 6.1% to 6.3%. I must also share this with you. I'm sure many people Many politicians will say, this is great, this is a great achievement, but I don't believe in it. Why I don't believe in it? Because India has the potential of growing at not less than 8%. Our capital, incremental capital output ratios, our potential is more than 8%. It's not a dream. China grew at above 10% for 30 years at a stretch we are certainly more hardworking than the Chinese, as different authors over time have shown that India was the richest country on the planet for 3,000 years. We have the potential. We have already demonstrated to the world in the last few years, about 70 years after independence, that we can find our own way. So 6.1% and 6.3% that you see of India are the highest but they are not our potential. They're below our potential. We can easily grow at 8%. Now, this is the future till 2028. This data comes from 
IMF, the World Bank, and in consultation with the Government of India, published by the IMF. The next set of data will come in October, and this is the last that we had, the latest, April 2023. And you can see that for the next five years, we are going to be the fastest country on the planet, growing at the fastest pace. America, now please remember, accounts for $21 trillion, which is about 20% of the world economy. We account for about $3 trillion, which is about 3% of the world GDP. When we grow at a pace of 6%, and they grow at a pace of 1.8 or 2.1%, they are certainly adding much more because their base is much higher. Keep that in mind. We really need to be happy that we are growing at this pace. For a long time, we were only growing at 1.5 to 3.2%. Now, at least we are growing at 6.8 to 6, uh, 7%. Reason to celebrate below our potential, as I keep repeatedly saying, fastest in the world, something to be happy about, but then we have a long way to go and a very big gap to cover. Now let's look at what's happening on inflation. On inflation, if we take a 30 year average, we cover around 6.1%. Americans, if we take a 30 year average for them, they have 1.8%. If we look at UK 30 year average, it's around 2%, Euro about 2%. Their inflation rose to about 10%. Very recently, in 2022, triggered by, triggered by the Russia-Ukraine war. Was that all? This is a war in Europe after a very long time, so one understands there are concerns there. But then the inflation picked up pace there, as you can see in the averages, very, very high. These are annual averages, which you are seeing. But if you looked at the data, which was monthly, which comes out regularly, they had touched about 10%, which is very, very high. And obviously one understands. Now this is inflation and growth rate on an average coming from the two tables that I showed you. I've just plotted it here now. And you can see that the inflation in emerging markets has been certainly higher on an average, but even in the advanced countries, it has peaked very rapidly. And then obviously it has impacted the growth. It has impacted growth for simple reason that there's a relationship. If inflation goes up and you have studied in your classes, you have the equation, your interest rates will obviously go up. And if your interest rates go up and you know the expenditure side of the GDP, your investment will suffer and your expenditure on consumption durable goods will suffer. And that's exactly what had happened. And your market borrowings with the government of India does, that's also going to be higher and that's going to create problems in the economy. So the growth will suffer. So you can see that growth is taking a beating here. Now, this is where my illustration starts. When COVID happened, everybody said, the dumb Indians, they're going to lead to lots of mortality in their country because we are providing such high fiscal stimulus. And you can see the size of the fiscal stimulus, very, very high as percentage of GDP. And now if you compare it with India, very, very less. These are the emerging countries. So now I was in Delhi, already in this think tank, already chairing Punjab and Sindh Bank, pretty close to what was happening, thinking, also strategizing. This was one country which has the highest number of people in the world and everybody scared us by saying that you will suffer the severe, this most severe attack of COVID if you come out with such a conservative stimulus. And here, and I can share with you, 
I conveyed a message. If the fever is 104, you need two crocents every six hours. Within a day, I got the response. If you have 104 fever, you need two crocents every six hours, not four crocents every two hours. Straight message. What did it convey? We are on top of it. We will keep our gunpowder dry because when COVID started, nobody knew it is a replica of 1918 Spanish flu. Nobody knew. Nobody in the world knew. Not even the WHO knew. It is some of us at Egro Foundation, especially me who wrote, this could be a five-phase phenomena which will last three to five years as happened in 1918. One of the few who wrote that. If it is a five-phase, five-wave phenomena, you will have to keep your gunpowder dry. You do not know what will be the next phase. By the way, if you look at the 1918 Spanish flu, if the mortality rate in the first wave was X, in the second wave was 5X, in the third wave was 2X, and then it petered up. And if that was true, and if that could get replicated, then the worst is yet to come. So please understand that. And when I got back the reply that two crocins will be administered six hours, but not six crocins every two hours, the message was clear. Not only that, during COVID, what did the government do? And this is amazing. And this goes to the credit of the government. They did not sink their money in revenue expenditure. Rather, they built assets and enhanced capital expenditure. It needs moral courage to do it. And they did it. There was enough criticism in the country, in the media, at the IMF, at the World Bank, at all international forums, that the dumb Indians, as ever, are going to line up their streets with dead bodies because they do not understand what COVID is. And here the Indian policymaker said, we know what COVID is. And now, see what happened. As COVID receded, unfortunately, and you can see the movement of interest rates, which came tumbling down during the COVID phase, and as COVID receded, the war happened. The trigger was the war. And look at the way the interest rates shot up, like there is no tomorrow. These are called knee-jerk reactions. And I always tell the Western, and this is only an illustration I'm giving you, there are five back illustrations. I've already told, always told the Western policymakers, the Western economists, that in public policy, you cannot have knee-jerk reactions. Because you can experiment. Because you are rich, but a country like India cannot experiment because one year is enough to eliminate many people. And one has to understand that a country like India, which is just 3% of GDP, but has 16% of 3% of world GDP, but as 16% of population has far more responsibility on their shoulder. But you as Americans, you as Europeans, or the Brits, have 40% of world GDP. You have a bigger responsibility. Therefore, your every step has to be measured and conservative. But no, the complacency was too much and the arrogance. So look here what's happening. This is of course a replica of the previous chart. I've truncated it to look at 
and to look at almost what is happening around and after the war and you can see the rise is super sharp. Now, this is the balance sheet of the Fed Reserve. And remember the quantity equation or, or as Professor mentioned, inflation always everywhere is a monetary phenomenon. This is the balance sheet of the Fed Reserve. And you can look how from 2007 to 2012, the balance sheet shot up and then till 2014. This is the quantitative easing which the Americans are talking and the balance sheet has shot up four times from one to four. Monetary economist and if Milton Friedman was alive, he would have told them this will blow up any day. But it did because times were abnormal. Quantity equation obviously works in normal times. Things stabilized, quantitative easing continued, and then happened COVID. And now look at the balance sheet where it is going from. It's shot up, again doubled. From 2007 to 2014, 2008 to 2014, it increases four times, and then it doubles up. Money being pumped into the system. Obviously, a flashpoint was awaited. This is the Bank of England. Very stable. 2007 until 2007, very stable. Inflation averaging around 1.5 to 2 percent. And then look at the balance sheet, the way it shot up in billion pounds. Same story. America is the leader. What American economists did, the others are just going to imitate it. Cut and paste. The monkeying around. Bank of the European Central Bank was no different. They did exactly the same. Many in the world kept saying quantitative easing will burst one day like a volcano. But no. Nobody paid heed to it. India didn't do it like this. India also had its own issues. The problems of Lehman Brothers itself is an illustration of very stupid, irresponsible policy. But here you can see over a period of time, nearly a decade, without giving a thought, money is being pumped into the system. If money is going to be pumped into the system, there had to be a volcanic eruption. And that's exactly what you see happened. Now the issue is, if you account for 20% of the world GDP, the responsibility on your shoulder is much higher. The accountability of implications that would happen after this are much higher than a country like India, which is on the receiving side. And India resisted the temptation of any of these things. And obviously, our inflation continued to be in the range, range bound, as I told you, the average for 30 years is 6%. So what would happen if the growth, the few charts back I showed you for advanced countries and the table I showed you, if the growth is going to get impacted in these countries, which is Euro, UK and America, where does our exports get absorbed? Very difficult to push exports in these extremely uncertain economies. And that's what you are seeing. Our exports suffered severely. Our imports, obviously, heavily based on oil imports, cannot be reduced. And of course, some of our exports are based on re-imports like gems and jewelry, and those could not have come down. Nevertheless, you see the global trade, this is only India that I'm showing you, but if you look at the global trade, the global trade severely suffered under this. The net invisibles, the same story followed, even in the net invisibles. 
If you look at principal commodities, and I'm going to show you some of them differently now, see exports of leather and leather products after COVID, they're recovering and they're rising. And suddenly, because the growth there gets impacted, our leather and leather products exports, they suffer to these various countries. If you look at gem and jewelry, the same thing again, our exports are suffering. And if you look, and this is all the effect of the balance sheet, which I was trying to say. And if you look at the drugs and pharmaceuticals, the same story that while we were recovering, this growth hurt us the most. And therefore, we had to curtail this. Organic and inorganic chemicals. Again, the country, like the drugs, is doing better. And after COVID, we established that our pharmaceuticals are solid and they can contribute significantly to the global need. That also had to suffer. And you can see the growth has plateaued. Same story continues for the engineering goods and in various countries. So obviously then the question is, if this is how the world powers, the countries which account for 40% of global GDP put together, US, Euro and Britain, if this is how they conduct their business, then the global south is bound to suffer. And the global south, which has even now a domination, not of processed or manufactured goods, but of things which are still little basic, like handlooms, cotton yarn, what happens to those exports? So therefore, if you have to enhance the global welfare, the welfare on the whole planet, keeping in mind the advanced and the emerging countries and least developed countries, or in nutshell, the global north has to take care of the global south and then take the welfare upwards, this sort of irresponsible behavior has only led to a great detriment to not only India, to the global south. Even the services like telecommunications, computers, and information have also suffered a similar setback because of the high interest rates. The FDIs and FII, a similar story is emerging. I would agree with you that the stock market is showing exuberance largely because the whole world understands India is one such country which has very good regulators in terms of the RBI and SEBI and then we have about 5,000 listed companies on our stock market. Unlike many, many more which are not listed, but these are a barometer, sort of a thermometer, which tells us what is happening. These are doing well because the potential of the country is very high. Given that the potential of the country is very high, the behavior of FDI and FIs is obviously positive. Now, please remember, FDI is generally futuristic. FIs is generally the stock market absorption. And the stock market absorption is very high, obviously, for a reason that I mentioned to you, the potential that the country has. In these circumstances, when there is so much of global uncertainty, what should the country do? Obviously, a country like India, which has faced the 1991 crisis and had faced it alone and had the demonstration right immediately in its neighborhood in Sri Lanka, that when the crisis happens, when challenges come, you have to fight it all alone. The multilateral institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, they are not going to come to your rescue you will have to build foreign exchange reserves. To take care of your currency, you may have to sink some of the foreign exchange reserves to take care of the exchange rate. And that's the story that has happened 
in our country too. There was a time after 1991, we had the Balance of Payments High Level Committee chaired by Dr. Rangarajan, the governor of the RBI, and then also by YB Reddy, who later became the governor of the RBI, saying that the country needs at least 12 months of import cover, foreign exchange reserves to handle your imports for one year. We build reserves for 17 months. And then we had to bring it down because they're costly. And so the foreign exchange reserves that India carries is not 17 months right now, but little less, but you can see the movement here. Our exchange rates also took a hit, but please remember the exchange rates were not as badly hit as in other countries. The Sensex I've already mentioned. Now this is one table which I want you to look at and look at it a little carefully. And what do you see in this table? Amazing. The predictions made before the war and the predictions after. Why do I refer to the war? Because that's when the tightening happened the most. And you can see the whole world has suffered, severely suffered. And for whom? The knee-jerk reactions. That happened bringing in the Lehman Brothers and that happened when the war started. And that's why I told you right in the beginning the responsible and accountable behavior of the Indian policymakers, where COVID played a role, vis a vis the Americans and the Western policymakers, where they had the knee jerk reaction, bringing, bringing the whole world to this crisis. Look at the projections before the war started and the interest rate cycle changed. And look at the achievements, especially 2023, wasted for the whole world. That needs to be thought through. India's policymaking needs to be celebrated. And the Western policymakers advised that they will have to be more prudent, conservative, and responsible in their policymaking. The world suffers. India has been resilient. And that's something very important. The credit goes to the government. With that, I would like to conclude and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you.